These are my disclosures. Probably Globus is the biggest one because you're going to see a lot of Globus stuff. Um, all right, let me start out with um, kind of a, uh, a, a case because at the risk of sounding like a one-show pony, because all I've been talking about is MIS TLIF, um, it's still a great operation, and uh, I would say that that's probably the most common reconstructive fusion procedure that I do. Okay, so 67-year-old retired homemaker, non-small, has these x-rays, very challenging. Um, there's a grade one, almost grade two spondy, uh, disc space collapse on a non-small patient. So, what surgery should I do? Any thoughts on what would be the surgery that um, all right, somebody what? A -lef. A -lef. T MIS T -lef or open T -lef? What else? Anybody else? Olif at five one with a grade two spondy. Okay, I got to watch you operate. Anybody else? Those are all really good options. But what did I do? I did my kind of workhorse procedure. I take a procedure that I'm really good at and just simply go bilateral and then utilize some non-silly, simple uh, implants that uh, can go in small and get bigger and fill up the space and allow me to realign the spine as best as possible decompress the neural elements, and get good stable fixation so that the bones will fuse um, and she won't have to keep coming back with some kind of problem. So that strategy, you can just see from that x-ray, um, allows you to get a fairly strong realignment procedure and assuming that it's stable, it will fuse. And at three years post-op, she's not perfect because she's one of those like everything aches, but Pre-op, she had a lot more back pain and a lot more ridiculous symptoms. Post-op, she's got less back pain and more kind of proximal pelvic tendonitis kind of symptoms. Um, and her ODI is now 38 versus a 70. So that's not an un unusual patient. Uh, most of my patients are in their 20s, but I would say that for this particular patient, I'm happy. And you can just see what kind, she's like a pro-inflammatory patient. Everything hurts, especially the rotator cuff. Uh, and that's kind of what it looks like pre-op and post-op. I can't do much better than that with an A-lift, especially lateral since I haven't done any. Um, what was the other one? O-lift, et cetera. And if you kind of look at the MIST lift literature, there are probably hundreds of papers, and there's probably at least three systematic reviews of the literature and at least one or something meta-analyses, including this one. Uh, and if you look at this, these are the numbers that I like to see. In the, you have to compare hundreds of patients with other hundreds of patients. Um, and I think most of us in this room kind of don't question whether or not MIS TLIV and open TLIV are much different. Overall, they have very similar performance characteristics. Um, and the thing that I love the most about an MIS TLIV versus an open TLIV, for example, not necessarily an ALIF or an L5S1 OLIF, is that an MIS procedure compared to an open posterior lumbar procedure, the infection rate is dramatically lower. So I've done this many times. Um, the, MI, the guys that do mostly MIS posterior, won't, how many of you have had an infection in the last 12 months? 20, okay, you probably do 100, 24 months. Five years. Okay, so I know Paul's, he's had one infection that I know of. Deep, deep, like where you have to go in there and wash it out and put a pick line in. Below the fascia. Not like a little superficial infection that you watch and give some Keflex. Ones that require return to the OR. I don't think there's any open surgeons, but if you guys are all open surgeons and I said, when was the last time you had a deep wound infection in the last 12 months? Half the room would raise their hand because it's just... The difference between playing with a titanium driver with a graphite shaft and a persimmon driver. All things being equal, you're going to have an advantage with a better tool. So if you look at you know, the data on this, there's a bunch of them, but this is an example of you know, kind of a powerful database. Uh, this is the SRS database. The infection rate, the deep-seated deep infection rate, looking at 6,200 patients, is about 2%. That's about right. That fits the, that's in the right ballpark range. 
2% per year, uh, 2 overall infection rate. And my STLF, 0.4%. So it's not like this 5%, 10% decrease. It is like a 500% decrease in the infection rate. It's probably even more than that. So, why do I love MISTLIF? There's a gazillion reasons. I could go on probably all day. The first is that this is a procedure that lots of people have done in lots of different practice settings in lots of different countries, util utilizing lots of different kind of strategies and lots of different people. And we have a very broad, real-world experience. And that's helpful because it's a better way to understand the performance profile of anything. And it's versatile. So if I had a T5 tumor, T5, that needed a corpectomy, it is very difficult to get to. You either have to crack the chest or you have to deal with the latissimus muscle and the scapula. But if you do a two-level mi steel of approach at T4-5 and T5-6, you can do a posterior corpectomy. You can also go all the way down to L5-S1, and you don't have to deal with patients that have abdominal problems. Because even if they have back wound problems in general, unless it's like a huge pseudomeningocele, you can do anything, even though they've had previous surgery in the past. And if they need a direct decompression, you have that too. So the versatility of this approach is one of the reasons why, um, A, there's a lot of people doing it, and B, if you said, Chol, you just get to have one MIS approach for the rest of your career, I'd be like, oh, what am I going to do? I can't decide. I'd probably pick this one. It's also kind of simple, and it's familiar because we do open T lifts, and the posterior approach, I don't know why, it's just very you know, like comforting, and it's like, I'm home now. I know where I am. Um, and for a variety of reasons, it's got a broad real world experience. It's simple and familiar. Um, and we've just gotten better teaching people how to do MIS T-Lift. The learning curve is much better, and probably the, it has the, in my hands anyway, and I do a lot of like teaching uh, and, and cadaver training, the MIS T-Lift has probably the easiest learning curve. The lateral seems like it's the easiest, but it's one of those things where if the lateral goes well, it's like the easiest thing in the whole wide world. If it doesn't go well, it's a frigging long, ugly, scary day, because doing an L-Lift wrong can be lethal. It's very difficult to kill somebody with an MIST lift. You'd have to like actively try probably. In a lateral, it can happen very easily. So thank you. Anybody have any questions? Uh-oh. Shoot, I should have told Jeff to feed him like a really complicated question for which I knew the answer. Now I'm hosed. No, because um, like you talked about this thoracic corpectomy, right? And so I've not done one of those through a T-lift approach. So I'm assuming, and you know, like if you do it, do it open, it's more like a costal transversectomy. So if you're doing these thoracic corpectomies, then are you with a tube? Are you then going down and doing like rib resections, and then going out in, in an approach similar to a costal transversectomy? It is basically a costal transversectomy, but you don't have to remove as much of the costal vertebral joint. You could just be slightly medial to it. And I don't use a cl closed tube, although you can. I like using an expandable tubular system because at some point you have to expand the yeah. tube to see both T4-5 and T5-6. So you're doing discectomies above and below yep, first. I do then, the T-lift inner uh -huh. body first. Then I, do the, I take down the pedicle. And then I use a downgoing Epstein-like tamp. Mm. And I implode the vertebral body anteriorly. And then I scoop out all the stuff. And then in the thoracic spine, you can take a nerve root proximal to the DRG. Do you? Very, if I try not to, but mm -hmm. I have a very low threshold. You can't do that in the lumbar spine, obviously. And then how about in the thoracic mentals? spine, it's much better to do that than to tug on it and develop a traction injury in the, in the cord. That and would kind of How suck. about segmental artery and vein? You just try to stay away from that by staying slightly medial. But to you, the ha you have to take it down joint. if you're doing a corpectomy, though. Oh, oh, okay, the segmental arteries, so not the intercostals. The segmental arteries, yeah, they get taken down just by, like, mm -hmm. you know what, what you do when you um, do a uh, um, uh, pedicle subtraction osteotomy? Mm -hmm. You start doing the subparasol dissection along the lateral wall mm -hmm. as soon as you find the pedicle, and then you start pushing in those peanuts. Mm -hmm. That's basically what I do. And then, you're and then think about it. You don't have to, like, get, um, because I'm talking about a metastatic tumor. Yeah, I'm not yeah. talking about a primary tumor that needs an on-block resection. That's a whole different... You can't do that on my ass. Mm -hmm. But you're just doing like an eggshell mm -hmm. decancelization and 
decompression of the mm -hmm. canal mm -hmm. and then a stabilization. So you're debulking, decreasing tumor load on a metastatic case. So and then you're, you're using an expandable cage at the end? Yes. Like so then you have cage, to use right? an expandable cage that you drop in, end yeah. on, roll, mm -hmm. so it's up and down, then attach the expander. That's the little tricky part because there's not a system designed specifically for that, but you have to put the attachment device on once it's in there, get it on there, and then expand it. Chul, you should give a talk on that because that, uh, that's not very well described. You know? I don't do that, sur that surgery that much, but yeah. It's on my list of things to do, item number 457. <laughs> Thank you. Th great talk. One question I have is uh, lordosis, especially like 4551, five, TLIF. You know, you, like, I worry about, you know, we always learn that TLIF is the kyphosin procedure if done incorrectly. Are there any things that you do, like, os like osteotomies, compress, you do, like, or facetectomies, and try to get more lordosis with your cages, or do you rely purely on the cages, the expandables? No, it's another one of those things. It's like I do a little bit of everything. It's the law of cumulative incremental improvements. So I use expandable devices. I try to put them way anteriorly. Um, and probably the single, and I release, I either go bilaterally or I'll do a thorough release of the contralateral facet joint. And then the ipsilateral facet joint, if I'm just doing a unilateral approach, is um, uh, completely removed. I do a thorough discectomy and limberize the disc, make it limber. That's the term that somebody from Orange County uh, made. And get that disc space kind of mobile and if that doesn't work and you still need more, um, I thought I was being like one of the first persons, but of course the Koreans done it before. I think either uh, Sung or Dr. Ha had a video where he does a posterior ALL release. So that's the other thing that I do. I don't like talking about that because that's not ready for prime time and that's not something you should try at home. But you go in from the back. At L5S1 is the only place I did it. You make sure that the bifurcation's already occurred and you have like two different kind of cob looking osteotomes and I hit that out the front and I do a ALL fenestration. I didn't have to do that for that patient. She was mobile, but there are patients where like you think, okay, she's going to reduce and they're just stuck and you still need that anterior column open. That's good for that. So posterior ALL release when necessary, bilateral facet releases, thorough discectomy, loosening up the disc space because sometimes I'll, it'll, you'll hear like a little crack um, and then expandable devices placed as far anteriorly as possible. There's probably five other things. That and like, Lord, please let this expand properly. 